Yeah. Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 25 of the Protection Dog Podcast, where we offer an alternative to conventional training methods and philosophy. I am your host, Joel Riles, and today we are going to talk about potential and if there's anything you can do to make sure you don't waste it both your personal potential as well as your dog's potential. But before we get into that topic, let's uh, go over our sponsor for today's episode. Today's sponsor is Canine Academy Online. Canine Academy Online is making dog training easy. We have local training in the uh, greater Orlando, Florida area. We offer an online training subscription where you can uh, follow our training videos and we also have uh, interactive problem solving library and a private Facebook group where you can ask any kind of questions that you uh, have or problems that you might run into. And then we also have uh, private in-home training and uh, we are offering board and trains uh, for your dogs as well. Uh, we cover topics like obedience, service dog training, tracking, like search and rescue type tracking, protection training, and tactical training. You can contact us on our website at canineacademyonline.com. You can also email us at joel, J-O-E-L, at canineacademyonline.com. And you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube by searching for the letter K, the number nine, Academy Online. And uh, also, before I get into this uh, topic for today, um, by the time this airs, we should be just a week or so from our German Shepherd, Dutch Shepherd cross breeding uh, that we did, the puppies for that being on uh, ground. And uh, currently, uh, we have a couple of slots still available on that litter. Uh, so if you are interested, make sure you contact me. Um, and if you're uh, interested in a Malinois or one of our other future litters, uh, you can also contact me there. Uh, we've already got uh, several reservations on our upcoming Malinois litter that will be on ground in early 2021. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and jump into today's uh, topic. So what kind of prompted uh, today's topic discussion is uh, I was kind of um, thinking about some of the previous conversations I've had with people in the past and uh, one of the things that I hear quite frequently is people will say something to the effect of um, I hate it when I see people wasting their potential um, or I hate wasted potential, things of that nature. Uh, maybe you've said something like that yourself. Uh, I know that I had previously uh, said things like that, and um, but that was before I really had a chance to think through what that statement means. And I also had several of my mentors kind of go over some of their thoughts on it. And we're gonna get into this a little bit deeper, but the bottom line is, Everybody wastes potential. There's no such thing as a life with no wasted potential, okay? So, for instance, um, you know, somebody who is a brilliant mathematician may also be a great athlete, right? And the chances that they would be able to fully maximize their potential as a mathematician and also fully maximize their athletic potential is slim to none. And the people that have the capability to maximize several different areas, so you know, they, they typically are viewed as like our geniuses and things like that, they have so much potential that they're still wasting 
tons of potential in a bunch of other areas, right? So when I was going through uh, high school and college, uh, I had a real knack for mathematics and physics, and I actually um, almost went into a, a physics major and probably would have been really good at it, really enjoy those kinds of topics. But ultimately I decided my personality, even though my capabilities are very high in mathematics and physics, my personality is such that I would be miserable sitting in an office all day long doing math and physics uh, type work. So uh, that's when I went into the army and then ultimately from the army uh, came across the working dog world and, uh, and then work, you know, basically committed myself to this life working with these dogs and these creatures. So, um, so let's get into a little bit about how do we have a life where we maximize potential in a specific area and we don't lose pretty much all of our potential. And that's really, I think, a far more important discussion than, you, than going the other way around, where we say, well, we don't want any wasted potential. Everybody is going to have wasted potential. But what happens a lot of times is in an effort to not have any wasted potential, people never maximize their capabilities in any area right? Um, they, they end up leaving wasted potential everywhere. They never do anything great in any one area because they're, they can't stay focused enough to do something long enough to become a specialist or a master at it, to become really, really good at it, right? So when we think about people who contributed in these very high degrees to Western culture, to uh, overall world culture, to technological developments, to things of that nature, it's almost always people who specialize in something um, to a very high degree, right? So you think of Bach and Mozart um, specialized in music and they took their musical capability, maybe not as far as they possibly could have because who knows what their uh, full potential would have been, but they committed themselves to music for the vast majority of their lives and they accomplished something tremendous and something great and something that still lasts hundreds of years after their death, right? Um, other people we might think of are uh, artists like um, Leonardo and um, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo for some reason. DiCaprio popped into my head and I don't think he's any good at anything so I don't want to get into him but uh, but so we have these great artists right and you know they even though uh, Leonardo da Vinci did spread his knowledge he probably was one of the greatest geniuses of all time he spread his knowledge over a, a great area he had a lot of theory and not necessarily a lot of practical application right but these people specialized in what they did and then we were able to take what they gave us and not only make use of it hundreds of years later, but still enjoy it, still remember them. And they're still viewed today as people who did amazing, great things because they took one area of their lives and they were able to give it a tremendous amount of their energy and their thought and develop that to a degree that it left a lasting mark in our cultures. So let's kind of take a look at how this specifically has come around in some of the discussions that have uh, been up on my Facebook account, things like that, reference some of the, the dog specific type discussions, right? So one of the comments that we got, and, and I addressed this a little bit in one of my earlier episodes, I think it was three or four episodes ago, um, where somebody came in and they basically said, well, a well-bred dog should be able to do all of these broad spectrum things, right? And they were saying something like they should be able to do sports and they should be able to do law enforcement work and they should be able to do personal protection work and all of these kinds of things. And when I addressed this previously, uh, I didn't spend a tremendous amount of time on it, 
but I said, well, maybe, right? Maybe they could do all of those different things, but it really depends on number one, how we're training, right? So to what level do we want to take each of those aspects, each of those areas of training? And how do we, as an individual trainer, how do we train for those specific things? So for instance, um, and, and we've discussed this a lot in various different ways, but I would argue that utilizing sport techniques with a dog that's been bred to have a very high drive for chasing a ball or a tug or a toy is not going to have the maximum capability um, that you could produce in personal protection work with a dog that is a little bit more stable in, in that particular area, right? That we could have uh, a lot more stable as we move around in public and all this kind of thing. And because of that, if you try to breed a dog that's going to be this quote unquote super well rounded animal, you're ultimately you're giving up certain capabilities in other areas, right? So the question becomes what are we trying to accomplish, right? And this really is kind of the overarching and all encompassing question of one of the reasons that I really started this podcast. And, uh, and it's, it's kind of the question that I continually come back to whenever uh, people start to you know troll our uh, videos or our pictures or the things that we do is so many people have this extremely limited, extremely narrow focus uh, or, or it, it can be focused, but it's also a lot of people have this super, super narrow ability to imagine something that all they can see is if you don't do something the way that they do it or the way that their person, their trainer or whatever told them that you're supposed to do it, then you're wrong, right? So they, they basically have that very binary view of life. They, they have this, well, you do it our way or it's wrong. And that is, is a viewpoint, that way of thinking, right? That binary way of thinking where it's either right or wrong is going to get you in trouble in a lot of areas in life. It's one of the things that's led to so much of the um, unrest in our nation today, right? Because there's this right or wrong viewpoint. And so obviously if you're not on our side, because everybody thinks they're right, of course, if you're not on our side, whichever side our side is, then you're wrong and therefore we have nothing to do with you at all. Rather than viewing life as it is, which is it's complex. Everything in life is complex. Relationships are complex. Political issues are complex. Moral issues are complex. Dealing with our dogs is complex, right? And dealing with something like law enforcement application is complex. So you have, you know, the, the probably the primary use of law enforcement application, which is narcotics detection. Then you have the, the second most uh, used application for law enforcement dogs, which is patrolling, right? Apprehension patrolling. And then your third is your explosive detection. And each of those are semi exclusive. Well, probably maybe even more than explosive detection, you have your search and rescue, right? So they'll use uh, hounds or sometimes they'll use the shepherd breeds uh, for search and rescue for things like, um, you know, a dementia patient wandering out of either an assisted living home or, or their home where they were living. Uh, or there's a missing child or something like that. And some departments will have dogs that do tracking uh, for that sort of thing. So you have each of these areas and if you focus too much on using the tugs and the toys for doing your narcotics detection, which is a fine way to do it as far as I'm concerned, um, because it's, it's a low stress, low risk type search, so the need, and you also almost always do that search in a, in a controlled or a semi-controlled environment. So if you want to use toys and tugs and your dog searches well for that, then great, do that. But when we shift from that over to search and rescue, right? Now, depending on your environment, depending on a lot of, of other factors that you may or may not have any control over, now things begin to get a lot more complex because if you uh, work, for instance, in Florida, where we train, 
in the summertime, this week our temperatures are, are like, feels like temperatures, our heat index or whatever, is in the, the 105 range, plus or minus about three degrees all week long, right? So it's like 102 to 108 in that range. Uh, every day this week, which is, you know, this is probably the hottest week we've had all year, and, um, and we're only gonna get it this hot a couple of weeks throughout the whole year. So if I'm gonna stop my vehicle, take my dog out, do a narcotic search, and then put them back in the vehicle, that is a very low stress exercise for the dog. The dog is in an air conditioned environment, then they get out, they do their search, and right about the time they're even really kind of recognizing that, that it's hot outside, they're done with their search and they're back in the vehicle, right? So that's very low stress. And again, so you wanna use the, the tugs, all that kind of stuff to work the dogs in that situation. No worries, no issues, everything works out great. But if you're trying to search for a child who is lost and there's multiple bodies of water in the area, which in Florida there's almost always multiple bodies of water nearby, um, and my dog might have to search for an hour in the heat now we have a whole different situation because it's extremely difficult to get a dog to push through and to work in that kind of environment unless number one you've acclimated them to the environment number two you've actually worked them in that environment for extended periods of time um, which is partly acclimating but it's also kind of like a fitness type of a, of a situation and number three they have to have a reason that they're working that will cause them to drive through the discomfort of the temperature, the heat, um, you know, and ultimately, you know, you're gonna be flirting with, borderline with, you know, heat exhaustion, probably both for you and your dog, um, depending on how, much, how often you train in that environment as well, right? So, these are all situations where training a single dog to try and do those multiple tasks it's not like it's impossible, but you're if you have a single dog doing multiple tasks like that, you're you're having trade-offs in one area or another, right? We get back to it's complex. So you basically all of this boils down to two options. So we, we ask ourselves, what is it we're trying to accomplish, right? The the foundational question that we should all be number one asking ourselves of for ourselves personally, and we should also be asking this for our dogs, is what is your end goal, right? I will often, when my uh, people ask to be interns uh, in our business, I usually say, what is your goal five years from now? What do you wanna have accomplished in five years, right? And if their goal isn't, I wanna be a dog trainer and I wanna be you know, making money doing this full time, then probably we're not a good fit, right? So. What is your long-term goal? You know, most dogs' working life is about five to eight years, and so you know, what do you want this dog to accomplish in the next five years? Now, we might want a dog that's a jack of all trades, right? We might want a dog that has as broad a spectrum of capabilities as we can, and um, and so, for instance, maybe you're a person who. Uh, does search and rescue and I know most search and rescue teams don't want dogs on their teams that are bite work But let's say you're one of these people that you go, you know I want to do search and rescue with my dog, but I also want to have a dog that will protect me So I want a personal protection dog and maybe you're a veteran and you have PTSD or, or uh, What do they call it? Uh, anxiety disorder and uh, And so you also want your dog to function as a service dog, right? So you've got these, these multiple capabilities and characteristics you want your dog to be able to perform for you that is definitely something that you can do. You can definitely train your dog to perform all of those tasks, but you're not gonna have any one of those tasks be quite as good as it would be if that was all you did with your dog. Now, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I'm just saying that that's reality. So when we start looking at wasted potential, when we start looking at what it is we wanna do, when we start asking ourselves the question of, what do I want to produce in my breeding program? When we start asking ourselves the questions of, what do I want my training program to produce? When we start asking ourselves the questions of, what kind of dog should I get for our law, law enforcement agency? When we start asking ourselves the questions of, I want to protect my family, what kind of trainers should I look for? 
right? All of these things ultimately depend on the question of, well, what are you looking for? What are you trying to accomplish? What is your end goal, right? And if you can't answer that question, then you probably need to take a step back and focus on that first before you start worrying about a lot of these other things that are out there, right? Because the dog world can become very confusing very quickly. You know, there's people that are doing, um, you know, tons and tons and tons of sport training and then calling those dogs various different things. And there are people who are doing various other things and never doing any kind of real true stability with their dogs, but saying that they're safe around families and on and on and on it goes, right? And you know, everybody's got their strengths, everybody has their weaknesses, but when we start asking ourselves these questions, we need to be honest, we need to have a broader perspective uh, than what is commonplace. And we need to decide, do we want a dog that has a, a wider range of capabilities, but is not as quite as specialized in any one area, right? So we're gonna be giving up potential in, in these specific areas. Or do we want a dog that is highly specialized in, let's say you want an explosive detection dog so that you can do contract work, right? And so you get a Malinois and you start training your Malinois to do explosive detection work and you get contracts and you do that work. So now you're going to be a specialist in explosive detection, but you probably, if you're doing that, are giving up a ton of potential in the protection work, sport capabilities, uh, dock diving capabilities. You know, there's tons and tons of things that you can do with your dogs and that you would enjoy, that your dog would enjoy. But at the end of the day, you need to decide what it is you want to accomplish and then start to work in that direction, start to work in that uh, area. And um, it, it reminds me of a uh, radio show I was listening to not too long ago where this guy uh, called in and the guy that does the radio show is an, uh, he's an artist he's an author primarily he's been writing books and scripts for uh, movies and screenplays and all that kind of stuff most of his career and uh, and this guy wrote in because he does these like you know question and answer kind of things and this guy wrote in and said basically um, you know I'm an artist too and I've been painting and you know sketching and writing you know authoring uh, working on my books and 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 all these different things that he was trying to do right like 10 or 12 different areas that were all in the field of, of the arts but were things that each one requires a huge amount of time energy and development to get really really good at it and the guy's advice to him was because he's been an author pretty much his entire life and his advice was pick one thing and do it well Right? Pick one thing and do it well. If you're trying to do a whole bunch of things all at the same time, generally, you don't do any of them well. Now, when I say pick one thing and do it well, you could say, just like we did with our, our example of our veteran who wants to do search and rescue and have a protection dog and a service dog, that's still in my category, my way of thinking, as long as you narrow it down to a subset that you can give a reasonable amount of focus to each section, then you still are largely falling into that category of um, picking one thing and doing it well, right? And uh, But when you start trying to spread yourself so thin that you really can't give the time and energy that you need to any one of the areas to, to develop it to any kind of, um, you know, anything close to being mastery, then at that point, my encouragement to you would be slow down, back away for a minute, narrow it down to say one to three things that you wanna focus on, that you wanna specialize in, and then move into those areas. Now the earlier you can figure this out, the better. Right, if, you've got, if your dog's five years old and you've been spreading the wealth you know, between all these areas for five years, your dog is probably pretty decent at all of these, but you've only got, you know, maybe three to five years of working life left in this dog. Um, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're over the, the peak of the dog's capabilities and you're kind of on the downhill slope at this point. And so if it took you that long to figure it out, probably, you know, it might be a good time to start looking at getting the dog's, you know, long-term replacement 
keep your dog, let them kind of keep doing what they're doing and maintain them and, and start working the next dog in the more specific areas, right? And because there's only so much progress you're gonna be able to make with that particular dog. If you're listening to this and you're in your you know 40s, 50s, 60s, um, you know, obviously the farther that goes, the, the less time we each have to develop a lot of this stuff in, um, you know, to any high degree. But what's, what is interesting is most people that are considered uh, to have accomplished greatness in their lives don't really start um, to, to get any kind of true capabilities until they're after 40. And uh, when I, I heard that, there was, it was a much longer uh, discussion on the topic. But basically, the person's point was uh, most people before 40 are just kind of running around chasing their tails and not really being able to figure anything out. And so they, they gain a lot of experience, but it's just kind of random experience for the most part. And then by the time they hit, they get around 40, they are able to narrow their focus down to what they want to do. And then they're able to accomplish something of significance at that point. And when I heard that, I was probably in my late 30s at the time. And I was starting to kind of feel like, oh man, I kind of missed all these years. Uh, and it was very encouraging to me. And, uh, and that was, I, I'd been working dogs for a number of years at that point. And so it was easy for me to go, well, this has been a passion of mine for a number of years now. I've been doing a lot of other things as well, but now I'm going to pretty much put most of this stuff away and just focus on developing this one area of my life, which is the dog training and specifically the personal protection aspect of that and taking these dogs to the highest capabilities that I can in this area, right? So if that's where you find yourself, and, and this would be, uh, you know, maybe you're a law enforcement officer listening to this podcast and, you know, you really love woodworking, right? You're a canine officer maybe and you enjoy doing your canine work, but you really love woodworking. Well, maybe woodworking is where you should be pouring most of your uh, energy and developing most of your capabilities. Uh, whatever it is, narrowing your focus to one to three things and then developing those one to three things to the highest level that you can will accomplish a lot more in your life than trying to quote unquote not have any wasted potential by trying to do so many things that you never really get good at anything, right? And again, you know, there's, there's a time and a place and a benefit to the kind of jack of all trades person. Um, but even that has limited uh, usefulness, limited you know, potential and capability. And uh, I've had a bunch of friends who were really jack of all trades. And while some of the stuff they could do was kind of impressive and some of the amount of knowledge and information they had um, was like, wow, that's, that's really neat. Their lives were kind of a wreck because they could never stick to anything. They would start to do something, they would get a job, they would start developing in that uh, career field, and then, well, you know, but I feel like I'm missing out on all these other things, and it would all fall apart on them, right? And so they are sometimes in their you know, mid to late 30s or mid 40s, and they still don't really know what they're gonna do because they haven't ever narrowed it down to one to three things. And, uh, and try to focus on that. So I think what I'm gonna do for our next podcast uh, topic, um, as I've been talking about this, uh, I've been mentally debating whether to get into this topic or not. And I noticed we're about 27 minutes right now, uh, 28 minutes. So um, I am not going to start on this one, but in our next episode, we are gonna talk a little bit about goal setting. Uh, because again, it applies to what we're doing in the dog world. Um, because if we're just running around like chickens with our heads cut off, or we're not pushing in the right direction, you know, one of the guys I used to listen to used to say, if you don't know where you're going, any train will get you there. Um, if you have no goals, if you have no end state in mind, then you're never going to get anywhere. Uh, you're never going to be able to say, this is what I want to do and go accomplish it. Right? You just kind of are going to end up wherever you end up almost by accident. So in our next one, we're going to talk about uh, setting goals and staying focused on those goals. And uh, hopefully that will be beneficial to you guys. 
um, as you're developing and making your plans for what you wanna accomplish with your dogs, where you wanna go in life, and how you wanna get there. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up uh, today. And uh, don't forget, uh, if you want to reach out to me, uh, you can email me at joel at fortresscanine.com. Uh, you can also text me at 813-836-9244. I give out my phone number because I don't answer phone calls if your name doesn't pop up on my caller ID. Uh, so if you have never reached out and made contact with me before, do not give me a call because I'm not going to answer. Uh, unless you just want to leave a message and then I can usually check my messages within uh, two to four weeks. That's about my uh, my voicemail checking um, capabilities. So if you actually want to get in touch with me, uh, text me and uh, let me know what it is uh, you're reaching out for. And then if we need to have a phone conversation, we can schedule that uh, or we uh, we can just kind of text and, uh, and I can answer your questions that way. Don't forget to check out my websites, FortressK9.com and K9AcademyOnline.com. And if you're interested in our puppies, you put a slash puppies after FortressK9.com. And if you're interested in training locally with us, you put a slash training after K9AcademyOnline.com. And you can find out more information on both of those things. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram by searching Fortress K9. Fortress K9 Puppies or K9 Academy Online, and you can find K9 Academy Online and Fortress K9 on YouTube by searching for that as well. Uh, we have several more litters coming up this year, so if you are interested in getting one of those, uh, make sure you contact me and get one reserved. Uh, at this pace, I am having the entire litter reserved. Uh, usually uh, several weeks before the puppies are on ground. So if you're following our Fortress K9 Puppies pages and you're like, hey, that litter looks awesome. I want one of those dogs. It's probably too late. Uh, you can still reach out to me and ask. Sometimes we have one or two left in a litter. But my objective and what we've been accomplishing so far uh, with those pages is we have uh, between six and eight pups reserved from each litter before they're even born. So unless we have kind of a big litter or somebody backs out, uh, we're probably not going to have puppies available on the litters uh, after you see them on ground. So contact me and we will get you set up uh, with a reservation on a puppy if that's what you're interested in. So I hope this has been helpful for you and until next time, remember to train hard and stay safe. Canine Podcast.